by, I did a talk on Russian ARC a couple of years ago. I don't know if anyone remembers me from that. Um, but I actually study the history of movie going and exhibition. So I largely focus on the business and industrial history of film. I don't um, generally focus on the film text. But I am interested in ethnic representations. Um, I've done a little bit of work on Italian representations in cinema. Um, but I am very interested in the North because I study uh, the exhibition of, in northern Ontario. And I was actually lived in the Arctic as a baby, so I have a, a, a little bit of affinity to the area. And I'm very interested in looking at the um, historical representations of the North and how they're um, reproduced in many forms of media. And actually, Nunuk of the North uh, is the start of many of these representations of the Inuit in our culture. So, um, uh, let me start today uh, giving, I'm going to give a little bit of background on, on the film. Um, I'm also going to be talking about the uh, documentary aspect of the film and the specific type of documentary it is, which is an ethnographic documentary. Um, and then I'm going to address the uh, construction of Inuit identity in the film. And I thought it was really interesting going around um, that many people felt an affinity with the representations of the Inuit. Um, now, I might burst some people's bu bubble, but uh, this was entirely um, constructed by both Flaherty and, and actually the Inuit actors <laughs> that were in the film. Um, and I'll get into a little bit of that later on into the presentation. So, um, I'm going to start with talking a little bit about the documentary form in Canadian cinema. So many people know that uh, Canada is synonymous with documentary film. And many pe people would say that you know, John Gerson and the development of the NFB is where we get uh, this uh, history of the documentary form. Um, but I would argue, and some other film historians have argued that, uh, specifically Peter Morris, that uh, Nanook of the North is uh, representative of a specific form of Canadian documentary, the ethnographic documentary. Um, so John Gerson's uh, type of documentary um, is a journalistic approach. Um, uh, and it's different from what we see in Nanook of the North. And um, Gerson's style places the documentary as the observer, not as an active part of um, the film, unlike uh, Flaherty, who actively engaged with the community uh, to develop a dramatic and partially fictionalized, fictionalized um, movie. So I'll get to Robert Flaherty. So, um, Robert Flaherty was born in Michigan, but he spent much of his formative years in Canada with his father, who was a mining engineer and prospector. Before entering the service of Sir William Mackenzie, who of course was known for building the railroad, um, he attended Upper Canada College in Toronto. In 1910, he was contracted by Mackenzie to explore the resource, resources of the Eastern Hudson's Bay Area. During his exhibition with Mackenzie, um, they explored the Arctic and uh, became acquainted with the Inuit people, who Flaherty idealized as, an untu as untouched by modern civilization, which um, in actuality, if you read uh, historians, wasn't really the case, but he was part of many people in the early 1900s who idealized indigenous people as in touch, uh, untouched by the evils of modern culture, and um, this kind of has a very long history. So uh, in 1913, for their third exhibition, Mackenzie asked Flaherty to take along a motion picture camera in order to document the trip. Now, it's interesting, in the beginning of the film, he starts this narrative of how he started the film, and it doesn't actually add up necessarily with the, um, with the actual record. So um, uh, Mackenzie had previously used film as a public relations tool for the railway construction. And he felt that the use of the camera could be beneficial for his interest in the North. And unlike his um, introduction, uh, Flaherty did in fact take a uh, course in cinematography. And, um, uh, and then after that, that's when he started shooting um, film of the next two expeditions in the Arctic. 
1915, between the third and fourth expedition, he edited his um, thousands of feet of reel into a six reel documentary. Um, and, and, and sorry, into a six reel uh, documentary and uh, that was shown in the University of Toronto. So I, um, part of my research is actually looking through the American trade press. So the earliest mention I found of Flaherty was from 1915 in motion picture news. And um, this actually depicts his first screening of the earliest form of um, his, his movie. Uh, despite the positive press, uh, Flaherty was not happy with the film and he uh, continued shooting more footage to add to the reels until 1916 when he accidentally destroyed the film, which again, he mentions at the beginning. Um, what he didn't mention was that how he destroyed the film was he dropped his cigarette and barely escaped you know, with his life in the ensuing fire. Um, Flaherty, though, felt that the film's destruction was for the past, and he was not happy because he was not happy with the travelogue style of the film. Basically, it was a lot of um, uh, nature shots and not a lot of um, uh, looking at the Inuit culture. And so, he wanted to develop a narrative, an ethnographic narrative, in order to showcase the lives of the Inuits. Of his efforts, he wrote, quote, I wanted to show the Inuit, and I wanted to show them not from the civilized point of view, but from as they saw themselves, as we the people. In 1920, Flaherty returned to the Arctic and worked with a team of Inuit to shoot the film. The Inuit were not just depicted in the film, but they helped plan the scenes, they processed the exposed film, and they repaired the equipment. And um, just so you know, the, the Inuit that are depicted in the film, uh, you know, their names were, Nanook's name was not actually Nanook. Um, they were just community members that were brought into this. So the focus of, um, and actually I, I'm going to show a short film clip, clip in a minute, so maybe if someone could just turn the, uh, the lights off. Uh, the focus on representing First Nations people in cinema has a long tradition in Canada, starting as early as 1914. And this again is not the journalistic approach of documentary, but the ethnographic documentary. Um, 19, as early as 1914, there was a film made called In the Land of the War Canoes, which is also called In the Land of the Headhunters. Um, this film is often described as a failed documentary, but it really has a lot of similarities with Nanook. Like Flaherty, the American filmmaker Edward S. Curtis lived amongst the First Nations tribes of BC and depicted both aspects of their everyday lives and dramatized events for the film. So, I'm just going to show, I don't know, it's a silent film, so <laughs> it's just a, about a minute clip of And this is actually the earliest surviving film shot in uh, Canada. So, um, that's an interesting, I think you can see maybe some similarities between Nanook and um, this film. So, uh, getting back to Nanook, um, Flaherty from 1920 uh, worked on the film for over, the, for over a year, so it was complete in 1921. Um, by this time, he had difficulty finding distribution because uh, in 1921, Hollywood was 
was standardizing its production, uh, distribution, and exhibition. And there was little room for independent films working outside of the vertically integrated companies. <coughs> Paramount, one of the largest of these companies, of course they ran famous players, um, was the first to reject Nanook, claiming it was unwatchable. Pathé reluctantly took the film because of pressure brought on by the company that financed the film, Revillion Frais, which was actually a, um, a fur trading company. Um, but really, uh, many scholars have now pinpointed uh, that it was really the intervention of the famous New York exhibitor, Roxy Rothfeld, who really helped make the film a success. So, um, Roxy is really an amazing um, figure in the history of film exhibition, and uh, I really, uh, uh, if anyone's interested in this history, um, to look at Ross Melnick's book uh, called American Showman. It's a really fascinating um, take on how influential this uh, single exhibitor was to the history of uh, film in, in uh, North America and even abroad. So um, Roxy, by this point, controlled the largest theater in New York, the Capitol. And uh, the films that he showed at the Capitol really were set up for success because he was a trendsetter with the films he chose to exhibit. And he, he's actually credited with popularizing German films in America um, uh, with his involvement with the cabinet of Dr. Calgary. Uh, he helped with the film score. Because uh, Roxy didn't just exhibit films, he also edited films and he, he did um, um, the scores as well. And he would have these elaborate productions uh, when he premiered a film. So when Nanook was premiered, they had uh, you know actors dressed as uh, Inuit and uh, there were sort of elaborate staging, there were live, live acts as well. Um, so really, when Roxy chose to exhibit, and he was he he um, uh, had the premiere of Nanook, it was guaranteed to be a worldwide success. So um, I again uh, looked through the American trade journals of 1922, and I found uh, numerous mentions of Nanook. So. In uh, trade journals, uh, they would uh, show images of the film and the story in order to, to promote uh, to the exhibitors to, to get the film. So um, uh, in here are the, the um, uh, you know, two examples uh, from 1922, and it's uh, Fatima uh, Tobin Roney in her work um, described that after this film, uh, you could call it Nanook mania because it was just uh, everywhere. So the film has a long legacy, unfortunately, with the Western obsession with the depictions of the primitive um, Inuit. Uh, Flaherty was part of a long line of ethnographers and museum curators who pack packaged and idealized images of the Inuit people. And uh, this is a very sad uh, legacy because many um, Inuit people were taken and exhibited um, at museums, live, um, live Inuit people were exhibited in museums and in zoos, and they were put uh, behind uh, cabinets, and many of these uh, Inuit people uh, died. And in um, Fatima Roney's piece, she says that she really links this to um, Flaherty, and she calls it ethnographic taxidermy, because by the time Flaherty um, went to the Arctic, Inuit people weren't dressed the way that he depicts them in the film. They were, in fact, in modern. They didn't use harpoons. They were using rifles. And she says that he's bringing in this form of taxidermy by dressing them in uh, antiquated outfits and depicting them in this idealized form. So uh, in that vein, I wanted to sort of turn to some of the images that we saw in the film, so um, in the, I, I, so these are just a, a couple of ones that stood out for me. I thought um, one of the really interesting bits was in the beginning when um, they encounter the fur trading company. Um, of course, Revillian Frise was uh, was sponsored the film. They were a fur trading company, so they seem to feature at least prominently in the beginning of the film, and so. 
I thought this was kind of an interesting wording, this tile card. Sorry if it, it, didn't, it didn't quite translate from my computer to this, but it um, says, uh, with pelts of the Arctic fox and polar bear, Nanook barters for knives and beads, bright colored candy, the trader is precious. So he's, you know, this is kind of the antiquated version of, of the native people um, wanting, you know, beads and candy uh, in, in, in trade for uh, knives and beads, which, um, you know, at, again, at this point uh, in the history of, of the Inuit, uh, they had rifles, they had modern equipment. Um, uh, it, it, it's, this isn't actually a, um, a real depiction of what would be going on with their relations with with fur trading companies. And in fact, uh, there were a lot of uh, striped relations at this point, and uh, uh, there was some in Inuit uh, warriors had, you know, uh, uh, would, would uh, often sort of have skirmishes with the fur trading companies. So, um, this is another problematic scene that's often cited in some of the academic discourses the gramophone scene. Um, it, we can see. Um, uh, so it says that Nanook has never seen a gramophone, and uh, he was show, showed one for the first time by a trainer. But as has been noted by Roni and several other scholars, uh, Inuit during the time of filming would, most certainly would have been exposed to a gramophone. Um, and of course, then we get to the scene where he's actually putting the um, you know disc in his mouth again, demonstrating that he's you know so, sort of um, uh, not not worldly. So um, another, uh, sort of the harpoon, so another problematic um, uh, scene in the film is uh, the utilization of a harpoon in the seal hunt. Uh, again, uh, Inuit people at this point were hunting with rifles. So uh, what's being pointed out by Roni and, and some other scholars is um, there are various scenes where the actor that's playing Nanook is laughing at the um, at the camera, and uh, there uh, were some oral interviews uh, years later. And um, what came out of this oral oral history is that the Inuit actually thought it was quite hilarious that the uh, that that they were asking them to, to do these depictions of themselves. For instance, the igloo was a, was a fake igloo. It was not one that they would have actually used, the clothing that they were wearing. And uh, the way, uh, the, um, using the harpoon for hunting, uh, he's also smiling at the camera. And some people have suggested that that was him laughing at the camera because he was you know, sort of doing something that he wouldn't normally be doing. So um, despite the inaccurate depictions of the Inuit and Nook of the North um, and other uh, later films, the fictionalized version of Indigenous people in Canada um, have become solidified as part of Canadian national identity. Uh, Nanook was just the first of many ethnographic <coughs> films depicting Indigenous people in Canada. And I just wanted to show another short clip of a 1930 film, a Paramount film, uh, the Silent Enemy, which was also shot in Canada and has a similar style to both Nanook and The Land of the War Canoe. So I'll just show a couple of
and uh, there's the uh, more of the clips are on YouTube, so we'll just move it along because I, I, I want to get to discussions because I think maybe there'll be some um, some questions for some of my assertions that I'm excited to get into a little bit of the debate. But um, according to scholar Samantha Arnold, the depiction of the Inuit in um, in Nanook and in Nanook and other films represents the Inuit as irretrievably foreign as the other defined against the safe and civilized southern self. But this imagined other has been appropriated by Canadians, especially in art and in film, as a means to create an idealized Canadian indigenous identity, or as Arnold puts it, an archetypal Canadian folk that is frozen in time. She writes, the transformation of Nanook into the folk invokes the same mythology of the Inuit as a primitive and bizarre people surviving in a harsh environment, but marks a shift from Inuit as other to Inuit as surrogate self. The folk are explicitly positioned as representing the living past, not just any past, but our past. This transformation transcends the fundamental otherness of the Inuit and Nanook by positioning them as different but also as our ancestors, whose differences is the very thing that we seek to reclaim for the Canadian nation. Love of freedom, resilience, purity, honor, and communion with the national world. Well, Nanook certainly has its place in the canon of both documentary and Canadian film, and it really is, it really does stand the test of time. It's a very entertaining film to watch. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating film. Uh, I do want us to be cognizant, though, of the constructed representations of the Inuit. Uh, these uh, representations are often ignored by the film theorists, <laughs> such as Bazan, which I think we can maybe get into a little, little uh, uh, talk afterwards, who venerate the reality found in the film. But I hope to have demonstrated today that this narrative doesn't actually represent the entire reality in the historical record. So thank you very much, and I, I hope we can get it. Thank you. Okay, for those few people that uh, aren't familiar with our uh, uh, 